Baby, you know that I'm pop star. It's a party outside. Guys, 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 guys. I cannot take myself serious. Golly. So, so I've got some good news. I, I've, I've made some, some headway on, on some systems design expertise, folks, expertise. Want to dive into episode three, which, uh, uh, there's a lovely viewer, Max. He, he asked, Hey, you're going to, you're going to continue this, this building a SaaS serious Max, my man. Absolutely. freaking literally Let's go. Let's go. I'm here for it. Borderline rock star. Woo! All right, all right, folks, we're in it. We're in it. Little energy. We're we're here for it. So so I started building this this kind of kind of lucid chart, and I'm like, hey, why don't why don't we just freaking record this and and talk about some of these deals? Uh, okay, sweet. So I'm gonna do that. Basically, the the first thing we're gonna build with with this with this SaaS product, um, it's not gonna be the full scope full scale product. I, I, I know what the product is going to be at this point. I have a solid idea. There's still some kinks I need to work out. But before we build the real deal product, I'm going to build this this event planner. It's, it's going to be simple. Basically, we just need to uh, uh, run through all the all the serious steps of like, you know, I, I don't want the complexity to be in the medium of the product quite yet. I want the complexity that we face in the series right now to be associated with the systems design. Uh, and we're going to tackle that first because these these are kind of harder things. So so the the, the thing that I want to build on the front end and, and we'll we'll probably um, get up a little UI UX, but but we really don't need one quite yet. Um, all all we're going to have is just a event with with this payload. Um, so we'll have a event that you can kind of plan something that you could say, hey, I, I've got like a, a, a Zoom call this day, it's this text, basically think of like a sticky note for events. Um, uh, basically a glorified to-do list is, is, is all we're gonna be building. And in, the reason is, is because it, it's gonna cover everything we need. Like first we're gonna deal with, um, uh, let, let me, let me kind of zoom out. This, this is something I've, I've brought up in very many talks. This is now just getting the AWS side of it. But but very many of my uh, things. Let, let's get a square. Why is this square not? It's like see through. I need I need a proper square, folks. I need I need a square square, not not this uh, not this half see through square deal. Um, but I want to show the system I'm kind of building right here. So we're gonna have a front end. Uh, where's my little trusty arrow deal? Boom. Here we go. Okay. So it's gonna make sense. It's gonna make sense, folks. So we have our API right here. Whatever our API is gonna do, it's gonna point at our uh, API layer. API, actually, we're not even gonna go to the API layer. We're gonna do a load balancer of some sort, uh, just just to get extra fancy with it. It's it's gonna be a fancy event planner, folks. I'm telling you, this is gonna be something, and we'll do some sort of elastic cache here. So, uh, but but without or excuse me, excuse me. This this won't be elastic cache quite yet. This will be pointing to. Hold on, guys. Hold on, guys. I'm gonna make sense of it all. Hold on, hold on. And this will point to the API layer, or the servers, if you will, a web server of some sort. Web server. I have no no idea why the text is all off like this, but um, this will then point to an elastic cache, and then this will ultimately point to our database. So this is gonna be the system we're, we're fundamentally building, right? And and the reason why I don't wanna build this huge, huge product, because we're gonna to have to do so much work just on the front end to build the huge product and, and on all these things. So the idea right now is like, let's just keep it super lightweight and simple because we have a lot to do. Um, so we're not gonna to spend too much time on the actual SaaS content of the product quite yet. We will get there though, we will do that. But initially I'm gonna show you all the things we have to do. First, we have to do form validation. So we need validation of data, right? And then we need some sort of API uh, uh, contract. So payload safety here that we need to do as well, just in the front end on top of building the, the thing. We might even have to do uh, pagination, right? And next tokens. So so next tokens and paginations um, for, for in short of what that is, you know, on Instagram or like Twitter, you know, you know when you scroll down to the bottom, you get like 50 tweets initially, you get like, you know, 20 tweets on your timeline. You scroll to the bottom and then it fetches more tweets. It shows that little next wheel. It's like spinning the little loader and then it fetches like 25 more tweets for you. 
or 50 more tweets for you. How it knows how to do that is through um, either a skip and a take or a next token, one of those one of those ways. So we need, um, what they call it is roughly pagination or pagination, something like that. But we need to develop that next token from the back end as well. So um, so we can kind of paginate through our events. So, so when we have a hundred events, we're not actually fetching all a hundred at once. We're gonna fetch like five of them until the person says the next page. Um, likewise with Twitter, there's billions of tweets or, or on Instagram, there's billions and billions Sorry, I got a little text uh, from my, my groceries. My groceries got delivered. Fun. <laughs> uh, but 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 on, on like, you know, Facebook, there's billions and billions of posts. When you log in on Facebook, they're not giving you a billion posts. They're gonna give you your little your little fifty posts for you. Then you get to the bottom of the of the screen and they're like, okay, we'll load fifty more for you. So we're we're gonna have to develop that as well. Um, load balancing, just in case we have a ton of requests. Uh, web server, Lambda functions, we're gonna have to figure that out. I, I'm not too confident in those. I've, I've built a few Lambda functions, not a ton. Elastic Cache, I've used Redis before. Basically, we're, we're gonna pop that in and we're gonna use DynamoDB for our non-relational um, uh, store here. So um, DynamoDB is, is NoSQL, right? Is it, or is that Aurora? Which, which one's the DynamoDB NoSQL? Let's see, fast NoSQL key value store, DynamoDB, perfect. So we're gonna use that. Um, we may even have a content delivery network that kind of uh, points all of our assets to the front end. So maybe if we have like a, a, a image of like we're an event planning service or something, Maybe, maybe page one will have a giant image that, that we want to statically deliver that content from a delivery network. So maybe we'll have a CDN here, like a cloud front from Amazon or something like that. Um, and then we might also allow for our, our post here, instead of it just being this event where we can have users type in a title and a description, we might also have an event um, image potentially. And if we do that, we're gonna to need to use uh, something called Amazon Simple Storage Service, which is going to be a S3 bucket. So let's kind of, let's let's actually take all this and let's let's put it into Amazon terms because um, uh, some of it is, is not in Amazon. Well, a lot of it's not in Amazon terms when it's built like this. So, but the, you can see rapidly why, why I'm like, guys, let's keep it as lightweight and as simple as possible because we're gonna have to interact with all these services. Um, we, we wanna use authentication, make sure that we're authenticating this entire system. Um, it, it's gonna be a whole deal. And I, I'm gonna have Chester, he's, he's a very, very ridiculously talented backend engineer. He's gonna overlook this process before we depart ways just to make sure that we are, um, we are moving proper and we're getting the cream of the crop knowledge. So, so I'm definitely gonna ask him um, alongside of this stuff because there's even more stuff we can add alongside of the system. You could, you could slap on job queues. Um, so a job server that, that would sort um, the job queues that get, uh, or the requests, the number of requests that get here um, they could prioritize, oh, you know, this person who maybe maybe they plan an event and maybe we have like a budget associated to our event. So so the higher the budget, the bigger the priority to get that request through is or something like that. Um, basically, we can, we can tack on a lot of things. Another thing that even just came to mind was um, a simple notification service. So when, when something gets updated to the database, maybe we want to update our end user, right? So maybe we want to tell our our person right here, hey, you planned an event. Shoot them a text. Let them know. Shoot them an email. So so you can see very quickly that that building this entire system and then doing it in a way too, where it's like with redundancy, maybe we have a redundant load balancer to make sure we're we're uh, robust. You can see right immediately like these are these are huge topics that that we need to cover. We have a lot of ground to cover. There's a lot to do, um, but understanding some sort of system around it, I think is gonna be really, really fun and a great challenge. Um, so so that's why that's why we're keeping it a simple, simple deal right now, because uh, because we got a lot to do. So and then and then not to mention, not to mention, just to just to throw a little more complexity on the whole deal here, we could package all this up into um, I think it's called Elastic uh, Kub Kubernetes service, where you can deploy these as containers, I believe. Um, not entirely uh, clear on that, how that works with Fargate and a few other things, but we'll, we'll, we'll do the research. We'll figure it out, folks. We will figure it out. So, um, so let's, let's start, let's start transcribing this into Amazon terms. Um, let me, let me unpack. So well, we'll keep that 
rough rough drawing there we're not going to do all this stuff immediately like the job servers and the simple notification service that'll be probably bonus material so let's just get this this streamlined thing down first um so let me let me get some shapes let's do some shapes let's find a user profile some sort of user nice this will do that'll do so this user is going to represent our front end <clears throat> um or or maybe a request or something uh maybe they do have a client system like a front-end deal client application fun fun look at that okay we'll use that instead so this is going to represent our front end right so this is our next js application or our react application what we're going to end up building in more than likely um and this front end we need to point at what is aws's load balancer called is it just AWS load balancing, is that what it is? We're learning folks, ELB, Elastic Load Balancing Service. We are learning, we are learning. So we'll say load balance. Uh, let's see if we, we have one in here. And what a load balancer does, uh, just just in short, I'll try to describe things as, as we use them and as we integrate them and as we learn about them together. Um, what a load balancer does is if you have, let's say, let's say there's a ton of, so here's our front end application, but let's say you have, a ton of requests like you have you have a million people who've signed up for your application or even a hundred thousand right or even ten thousand like like a realistic number of like ten thousand people sign up for your application and all ten thousand of them are making requests onto your application you know they're all logging in they're all submitting orders they're all updating their events you're getting all of these requests a ton of them right you're getting a ridiculous amount of requests that gets sent to your front end and ultimately sent to your servers and you need something to kind of, if, if your servers start getting overwhelmed, if, if they're not, um, if your application is running slow, maybe, um, you, you need something maybe, especially with like an event planner, it's okay if an application like that crashes, but if you're working like on medical devices, it's absolutely not okay that those things crash. Um, so, so you need things like a load balancer that you can actually replicate and build a bunch of these systems or a bunch of these servers rather. Um, so here, let's let's kind of delete some of this stuff real quick. So the load balancer, uh, AWS Lambda, we're gonna use as serverless kind of servers, or you can use like EC2, I think is what it's called for, um, well, it's, it's definitely called an EC2, but um, but a load balancer can, it'll, it'll decide which server is like least overran. So let's say a bunch of requests comes in, boom, uh, let's say this front end points to our load balancer. Here comes my little request. Do, 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 do. The load balancer will say, hey, which one of these servers is the least used? Well, okay, I'll put it on the, this server over here or this serverless function, right? And then next request comes in. Do, 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 do. Hey, which one of these servers is the least used? Okay, I'll put it on this server, server number two. Hey, which one of these servers is least used? Okay, I'll put it over here. Batch of three requests come in. Okay, which server is least used? Well, I'll put it on this first server. Okay. Here comes three more requests. Well, can I put it on the first server? Well, that's probably not a good idea. Let's use another server. So, um, and here conveniently comes three more requests and it pushes them to there. So, so that way, that way you're, you're kind of balancing the traffic. You're not, you're not just dumping all of these, these requests onto the first server that could crash it or, or something like that. So, so that's roughly what, what a load balancer does. And there's different strategies for doing it. They have like a round robin algorithm. They have a weighted round ro robin algorithm. There's even like an IP territory algorithm. So depending on, let's say this, this server or this request comes from like the West coast of zip codes or IP addresses. And then, and then maybe a, some, some of these are, are dedicated to like a West coast server or something like that. And then maybe these guys come from the East coast and they go to an East coast dedicated server. So, so there's different strategies to on load balancing, but we'll we'll probably just use like a round robin approach or a weighted round robin approach, um, um, and that just that just equally distributes them of just like who's got the least amount of of traffic. Just just put it on that one. Just always put it on the least amount of traffic. So if this guy happens to have five five circles, well, server three has the least amount of circles. So we'll just put the next request on that. So, um, but anyway, that's that's enough of the load balancing. Let's get back to our system. Um, so we'll use that ELB elastic, uh, load balancing service there. Let's kind of, let's write it down. Let's get it in text. Let's textualize it. ELB front end. Um, and then we'll also deploy the front end on amplify. We'll host. So that'll be our hosting service for the front end. Woohoo. Um, okay. So we'll put that here, maybe something like that. Um, okay. So can I draw an arrow fun? Nice, I can. Okay, so we have our elastic load balancer, which is going to point to our Lambda 
Um, and our Lambda or our EC2 instance haven't fully decided on how we're going to do this. I think we're going to go for Lambdas just to do, just kind of learn more of the serverless architecture and stuff. But um, this is our server. This is this is going to be whether it's our, our serverless uh, Lambda or our EC2 server. <clears throat> Basically, they're, they're, it, it's going to handle our, our um, server loads. So from here, let's say if we want to post um, a, a event, we're, we're going to need some functions. We're going to need our CRUD function on our create, uh, read, update, and delete. And we're going to have four functions for that, our, our create uh, lambda function, our update and read and delete lambda functions. And we are going to use those with um, what is going to be called a VTL. And this is an app sync thing, a VTL. Um, guys, this, this is a proper thing, by the way. This is this is knowledge straight from Chester, the, the guru himself. Um, so so a VTL is a, it's it's short for velocity template language in um, AWS. Search this up real quick, VTL AWS. And let's see what it what it does. Uh, is this it? Tape gateway VTL? Uh, no, not virtual tape library. It's uh, virtual or velocity template language app sync and what it is i think it's it's a resolver or acts as a resolver perfect a resolver mapping template for our database aws app sync uses vtls to translate graphql requests so that's what we're going to use is a vtl um <clears throat> And what this is going to do, it's basically going to let, it's going to interact with our database. So, so to some degree, this is almost like Prisma. I've, I've, I've described that previously to some degree. It's, it's kind of like an ORM, I, I suppose is, is maybe one way to kind of consider it. Um, where, where here in this VTL, we'll have, we'll have some setting functions where it'll be like set, set this, uh, this event in our DB. Right, we'll have we'll have some sort of VTL uh, templating, and 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 I can show you guys what that looks like. Dot uh, VTL templates. Um, let's see if there's there's an image of them. Let's see. Boom. Yeah, this is this is kind of what they look like right here on the left. You can like set stuff. You can you can kind of um, get the arguments from from whatever's being inputted. You can see even here it's like use this util to Dynamo DBA. It looks it looks a little convoluted, but but. It. We'll 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 get it handled. Um, again, guys, we're gonna kind of this is gonna be pieced out over a bunch of episodes. I'm just kind of bird's eye giving us our, our roadmap. Um, but we're we're gonna have a bunch of VTLs that can kind of set and get stuff and and do requests and responses with our database. So the VTL kind of ties these this together with the the payload that's coming in. It, it, it now lets DynamoDB uh, know like what to do. And then DynamoDB will store all of our events. So, so our events will come in in this payload shape and they'll, they'll come in with an event ID like this, uh, maybe an, an event title like birthday, uh, you know, and then an event description. We, we might want to put an event date there too. I, I forget, but um, ce celebrating, celebrating birthday, or, or maybe we won't have an event description. We'll just have an event uh, date or something like that. But but I, I, I want to keep the events lightweight. It's not really about the events, guys. I, I, I want to highlight that again. It's more so about getting this this whole system down, or, or at least like like we're we're definitely going overkill for an event planner, yeah, like. 100% we are. You you definitely do not need VTLs and AWS Cognito. Well, you, you might need Cognito for an event planner, but but you don't need like all these things. The reason why we're doing it is so we can deeply understand how these systems and services interact with each other, how they connect. So, so I, I just want to reiterate that again and again. Um, but we'll use DynamoDB to do all this stuff. And I am actually taking a database course right now. And I'm, I'm curious if Dynamo does sharding and... Um, uh, other things. I, so, so, so we'll have to look that up too. I'll, I'll have to, I'll have to um, Google that actually right now. Does DynamoDB do sharding and replicating? Let's see. Let's see what this says. A DynamoDB stream is made of many shards. A shard contains a time ordered change of DynamoDB from from one DynamoDB partition. I don't know what part partition is. Chester's tried to explain it to me many times. I still don't understand what it is. <laughs> so, so, so we will do some learning together, folks. We will absolutely do some learning together. Um, and sharding, from what I understand, is is you kind of store your data in multiple places um, in different different layers of of data. Um, that way, if like you lose one database for some reason, you still have like other two shards to pull from, um, things like that. So it's it's kind of a redundancy thing. But I think I think Dynamo handles all that automatically. So so that's the fun part for us is it does look like it handles all of that. 
um, let's let's keep building on this thing. So AWS Cognito, this is going to be our uh, what's it called? This is going to be for us to. Um, uh, Sorry, I'm just reorganizing this, but AWS Cognito is going to be for us to handle authentication and authentication looks like signing into an application. Guys, let me move my face back over here. It looks like signing into an application. Um, so, so that'll be fun for us to use. Guys, I'm going to remove this, this front end. I'm going to replace it with our AWS Amplify, which will represent our front end for right now. Um, AWS App Sync. This is where, where we need one of these things. Let's let's pull this. Does this thing rotate? We need we need one of these sideways. Boom. Um, we're gonna use AWS App Sync to to sync up our entire application. So front end from back end. I, I have a few kind of tutorials on on App Sync. On um, um, I was it was in. Uh, where is it? Actually, I, I don't know if I do have a full tutorial on it actually, um, but but I but I used it in a demo video for for a company and um, and basically what we're going to use AppSync for is to define our schemas and our our backend uh, material like our graph GraphQL endpoints and then we're going to pull those endpoints to our front end over here. Say front end. Oh, I I know why this text is all off. Boom. Uh, so so we're gonna we're gonna pull in our our. We're going to use App Sync to kind of make sure our front end and back end systems are all all running on the same payload and the same event um, uh, thing. So so we'll have our event payload. This will be defined in our schema. So this will be like our, our GraphQL schema. We'll we'll have this roughly defined, um, and then we'll also have some some endpoints. So we'll we'll need a get event. We'll need we'll need singular get one event, and we'll need get events. Um, and then we'll need, so, so these are going to be our functions or our methods that we call to, to kind of query these things. And we'll need create event. We'll need update event. And we'll, I think we'll need delete event. And I think, I think that's it. Um, and then somewhere along the lines, we'll, we'll need to return next tokens with, within all this stuff. So, uh, so those are going to be our endpoints. This is going to be our schema. <clears throat> so I like it. I like it. We're, we're kind of building this thing out proper, um, at least, at least somewhat proper. Uh, what else? What else do we need? What else do we do? We reference down here. So we simple notification service and the CDN and maybe maybe an S3 bucket for uploading images and stuff like that. So so if we do want to upload images, maybe I'll put an asterisk next to this. Um, I don't want to use S3 Glacier. We'll just use a traditional S3 bucket. And if we want to uh, upload stuff, I'll have to ask Chester or or one of my buddies. Um, Angel's also really smart with AWS. Um, We'll, we'll have to ask one of them on how does this connect to this? Do I need another Lambda? Do I need another Lambda function to go get the things out of the bucket? Do I also need to authenticate that request to get the things out of the bucket? And the answer is yes. And that's where pre-signed URLs come in. So, um, which that's a whole whole deal in itself. So I'll definitely ask Chester on that if, if we wanna do this. So, so you can see right away, guys. This this is a lot of chess. We're playing high level chess right now. We're we're, we're making these these larger moves. And uh, let's see, let's see. What what else do we need? We we probably want to just use IAM policies for our functions as well. So so you can see right here between the the AWS Lambda and VTL that there's a role will be in the token. And what that means is we we have oh, we're going to use the AWS IAM policy. Let's get rid of this cloud one, but same same deal. Um, so 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 when we authenticate our users in AWS Cognito, we can pass in a a access token with with their request to use a function. So each one of these functions that says like get event, for instance, or get events when 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 I pull the events for for PAGs for me for me as user ID number one. You as you as user ID number two, or maybe user ID number three, or or or, or whatnot, should not have functionality to um, access other users' events. And then also, you shouldn't have. Let's let's say we build a. So so this is what our our um, uh, uh, function or our event planner is. Maybe maybe me as like the admin, I'm the only one who's allowed to do to delete events. So maybe I'll I'll put a a. Um, a role with my token of like admin and and I'm the only one who can actually call query the delete endpoint. So even if you call the delete button, even if you're some hacker, you you figure out how to delete or, or call the delete endpoint, I'm gonna I, I should still only have like the only access to do that through through my access token and through my role. So um, so so we definitely want to do some overall security. 
which I think is going to be really important and integral to this too. So we'll kind of piece these two things together, I, I suppose, of, of AWS IAM policies and Cognito. I'm not really sure where, where I'll put this. I'll, I'll have to, again, kind of clarify with, with, with the man himself, uh, Chester, to, to kind of design this and I'll, I'll explain thoroughly what's, uh, what the goal is here. So, so I guess, I suppose, I suppose the IM policy would actually go right here. Uh huh. So let's, let's organize for that, or at least roughly plan for that guys. And I, I, again, I know just to reiterate, it's, it's ridiculous overkill. It is, it is maddening overkill for the system we're building to, to basically, uh, take, take on this. It's, it's absolute overkill, but, but it's, it's that by design. Um, and then let's let's do it. Let's do it on our front end page where we're gonna have a let's see, I think I think it's called CloudFront. Amazon CloudFront. I believe it's CloudFront. Uh, but let's let's put it let's put an image on our front end page of just like like a wedding party or something where where you can just like go into a, to to plan events. But but the the assets that we're we're gonna show on our front end are gonna be pulled from this cloud front. We're not gonna query them from from our server or anything like that, or from Amplify, they're actually going to be pulled from from a edge location, a a CloudFront uh, deal. So I'll have this arrow pointing this way. Um, so yeah, I, I think I think overall though we, we we got enough work in front of us. Maybe as long as I'm not missing anything major. Maybe um, I guess I guess the only other thing. And, and it's going to be super interesting to see what what we accomplish through this all. But maybe the only other thing would be would be the simple notification service. Let's see. Let's pop it up. Boom. There it is. Okay. And that would also kind of be this this underwritten thing uh, where we have this maybe something happens in Dynamo and we can tell our users somehow that like, hey, you you just planned event an event. Good job. So, so we'll, we'll, we'll try to plan for something like that. Uh, what else, what else? And, and I, I want to do, uh, so we, we, we need next tokens as well. Uh, but, but that'll kind of be somewhere within this, this, I, I don't know. I'll have to actually ask, ask Chester on that one. Um, uh, and what else did we talk about down here? I think, I think that's pretty, oh, elastic cash. That's, that's one thing we definitely do need to do. So I don't know where the VTL would be in regards to elastic cash. Um, for those who don't understand caching, I'll, I'll kind of explain it again. Let me clean this all up and show what uh, what caching roughly is. Okay, so so our front end, we have our to do list or or any front end application, and you make an API request, and the API request goes to our web server where where there's some some logic on the computer. And um, I'm not even going to put Elastic Cache here like this. Um, I'll just put this database way over here just for demonstration purposes. And basically you have a front end request and, it, and your front end request might be like post this thing on Facebook. I press the blue post button and I, I go to the web server and uh, the web server then fires off some logic and posts this thing to the database, right? And then maybe the database returns a post in response of a post and, and it shows that post now on the front end. Um, so what, what caching kind of does is instead of us, us next time going all the way to the database way over here and it's expensive, it's, it's very costly, it's very pricey to, to uh, let's, say, let's say you log into your computer and, you, and you, you basically you don't know it as a user, but what happens is you trigger a get post function this get post function fires off, goes all the way over here, cause running down the super expensive route to the database to go get your post. And then it returns with all those posts and shows you on the front end. So in our cache, what we do is, is when you trigger that get post um, uh, function, your posts get returned still, but it's just the first time. And the post will then get pushed into the cache and over to you on the front end. And the reason why we do this is we store things in the cache. So, so, and the cache also has an arrow next to it. So it's connected to all this stuff. Yes, it is connected. Yes. <laughs> uh, but, but next time you log in and you trigger that get post functions, you know, and, and there's, there's a lot of logic associated with this. Maybe, maybe get post is a bad example, but maybe like get your personal user settings or something, something that doesn't change very often. But um, but the point is, is there's data held over here. So so next time you trigger the same function within a reasonable amount of time, the server doesn't have to call this really expensive and pricey and go really slow to the database. 
it can just really quickly be like, oh, hey, Mr. Cash, do you have do you have the post in there? Oh, you do? Okay, awesome, bing, put them up here. It's really quick, it's really fast. So that's what caching does in a nutshell. Um, let's, uh, let's wrap that up, I suppose, and let's get back to our diagram. Uh, so, so, so we definitely want to integrate some sort of elastic cache for like the list. And, and I think the fun thing about elastic cache too is, is it, um, it actually has a cache worker installed in it. So if there's any changes to dynamo DB, it's kind of subscribed to, um, elastic cache where it'll Im immediately update elastic cache is my understanding of it. So, uh, I'll, I'll double check that that's true, but, but I think, I think that's, that's, yeah, this is this is more than enough. I don't know where the VTL would would sit in all this. I don't know if the VTL sits before Elastic Cash or if Elastic Cash sits on this side of it. I, I have no idea. We'll have to we'll have to figure that out. But um, but we we clearly have enough in front of us to build. Um, and then finally, of course, we can we can somehow do the the EKS and and the Kubernetes stuff. But we're gonna we're gonna park on that. I think I think this is this is more than enough of a system to build and kind of interact with everything. And I'm not sure we have everything right. Again, I have questions on the S3 bucket and pre-signed URLs. I have questions on where this IAM policy kind of sits in this whole system. And same with the Elastic Cache. So. Um, so I'll need to figure out those two things and then, or three things, and then I, I, I'm probably just gonna bother bother Chester a whole bunch. So um, so yeah, but guys, episode three, we have we have a bit of a roadmap in front of us, at least at least what we want to do and and kind of where we're heading next. Obviously, next we need to we need to generate a generic UI UX for us, and then also um, kind of configure AWS and sign up for that. And, and hopefully do it in a free way. You know, th this is the goal. This all needs to be a free service. So um, I know I know Amazon has a free tier. So so I'm anticipating using that if you guys are following along. Very excited for for part three, guys. Thank you so much for for watching. I'll wrap it up here. Boy.